Good morning, students and t teachers. I teach teachers, too. Now, that sounds like exalted, but it's not. Everybody who needs to teach needs to be taught, just like anyone who's going to be a psychoanalyst needs to be psychoanalyzed, whatever. So, I'm a teacher of teachers. Uh, I could say everyone's a teacher, so we're all teachers of teachers, because we all have a teaching function, right? Every one of us. We, we, we have a way of showing the world and so forth. And then we have a way of learning from the world. And then there's the question of value added. Do you take what you've learned and value add? And there's this whole GST um, model for that kind of thing. GST general system theory has been a topic here and a topic of my writing going back to the 1980s. But this is not a video about that especially. So obviously we're in Facebook. What I really want to talk about are space-filling tetrahedra as a topic that could be included in, say, early math, by which I mean, and it doesn't have to be math. It could be, like I say, literature. Because we're trying to trace some memes. We're doing memetics, actually. And <clears throat> mnemonics and uh, memetics study of memes are connected, right? We're looking at the history of ideas, in other words. And when the ideas are really simple, like what tetrahedra actually do fill space, then you're in what I might call meme territory, because that's something quite easy to track, because it's so definite. And that's what we have here in this 1972 five space-filling tetrahedra in the literature table, table one, by Michael Goldberg, who's doing a, he's a mathematician, and he's doing a fantastic job here of summarizing what's known up till his time in 1972. And then he's going to add, he's going to value add. So he's learning, and he's teaching, and he's teaching teachers. And he's teaching teachers about, these are what we call plane nets, right? It's got a tabular shorthand for mapping angles and lengths to these various diagrams. And you fold them up into tetrahedra. And they correspond, and this is, by the way, not in the table, what I'm about to show you, because Synergetics is published in the late 70s, not by 72. Otherwise, there would have been room for another row in this table. And did Fuller get all the space fillers? No. In fact, none of the authors did, apparently, up until Michael Goldberg himself. But the overlap is there, and so we're kind of in one of those Grand Central stations where we can follow different authors who intersect through this topic and follow, because usually they're, they're going to go on and cover other things that are distinct from this topic and kind of in a hypertune way, you know, we can follow that, their trajectories individually. Like with Goldberg, who continues to overlap at, actually with the synergetics quite a bit through the geodesic sphere meme and how can you pack uh, spheres and what patterns do you get? All these kind of questions are part of synergetics, part of virology, and Michael Goldberg is a prime contributor there too. But like Somerville or Hill, um, see, I'm not even that familiar. I know Somerville because I've been studying this topic, so I know Somerville studied it, the topic of space filling tetrahedra, but what else, right? What else was he into? We talk a lot about Carl Manger, the, um, the dimension theorist in this channel, because of the overlap with synergetics once again. But then there's all this other stuff that Carl did. And as a mortal AA battery kind of guy, I don't get to follow all these trailheads myself. So I've been just talking about, you know, Nietzsche's admiration for Emerson and listening to the videos again about uh, that whole thing. Zarathustra is partly based possibly on, you could say, Emerson's character as he comes through in his writing. Nietzsche was impressed. They never met. Nietzsche was born much later in time. <clears throat> as a shorthand, think of Nietzsche dying around when Hitler was born, because they didn't know each other either. Don't go for any comic book history where, like, Nietzsche was a, um, a Hitler guy, because he wasn't. 
by any means. See, I had Walter Kaufman as my professor at Princeton, and he was very explicit. In fact, part of his karma was to redeem Nietzsche from the trash of, you know, Germans had trashed their culture. And actually, Nietzsche talks about Germans as another people. When you write, read about, when you read Nietzsche, he talks about the Germans as if he's not one, and he's not really. He's kind of stateless after a while because pressure goes away. You got to remember in Europe, a lot of people felt more stateless than we realized because of the changing map all the time. So part of the cosmopolitan nature and what helped America be what it is, uh, part of the cosmopolitan, what makes a person cosmopolitan is what I mean to say, is when they no longer have a state, they fall through the cracks, or they never did. You know, they were born in a refugee camp. Like my friend Kiyoshi, I say friend, I knew him pretty well. Didn't hang out much, though. I went to visit him in Philadelphia. This is Fuller's um, chief assistant on, or catalyst on, a couple books. Critical Path, Grunch of Giants. Anyway, Kiyoshi was born in a prison camp in Wyoming. And so he was, in a way, though, not stateless, because he identified with the ideals. He understood what the U.S. wanted to embody in terms of values. And so you can be stateless and still be pro a set of values enshrined in some particular language game, like the U.S. Constitution, which around here we think of as an engineering document, or you could call it a circuit diagram. So that was a bit of a tangent here. The question is, what schools out there have the guts to talk about and share with kids something so basic as which tetrahedra fill space. And as you know, we do that all the time. We start with our cube, which you wouldn't know this if you haven't followed the channel. We think of kind of canonically as having a volume of three, which is immediately a break from everything you've been taught about it being a unit of volume. Now, some of you are thinking I'm full of it right now because there is no implied volume to any particular cube. It depends on the units that you use along the side. And here again, I'm using a second root of two along the side and calling it volume three, and you know that that's wrong because second root of two to the third power is not three, right? It's an irrational number. So already I seem to have lost a lot of you. You know I'm full of it. You know I'm just a cult leader who's misleading my cult, and you have proof now. But then people have studied even more and watched the slides that I invite you to share with others, understand where that volume three cube is coming from. And so if we can break this volume three cube into, because we have a different model of what it means to third power a number for one thing, and it's consistent, it's logically consistent. So in the higher levels of math, we would put this in the philosophy of math. We wouldn't necessarily try to compete with the mathematicians directly because it's so elementary school, right? What we do is so, and I don't mean that as a put down, elementary in higher math means foundational. Like to the root. Radical used to mean to the root because radical means root, but people think radical means extreme and so on. And I would say English. English has a lot of problems. It's radical to say that, but talk about buggy. 1 24th of a volume 3 cube is 1 8th. So that's a mite of 1 8th. And what we're doing with this table is mapping Fuller's later jargon, his 19, late 1970s jargon. So this is up till 72. Fuller's obviously working on this stuff somewhat independently because he comes with the A and B module dissection of the mite, what he calls the minimum tetrahedron. And that's column two here. That would be the mite. And then you can assemble that into a regular sphenoid, it's called. So there goes my mite. Two of them face bonded. And by the way, these are not chiral. And I, I've got a whole box of these. There's never going to be like, I can't completely superimpose them or juxtapose them. Vertex for vertex. And with mirror imaging, you can't do that. They'll still call it congruent. But they'll leave kind of as a footnote, oh, but there's no way you could actually superimpose them unless you 
go through another dimension, they say, with the mirror. Now, you can hear the that I'm being derisive. It's not about the concept of dimension here. It's about that we don't tell anybody that congruent is such a limited concept that doesn't incorporate chirality. And then we refuse to teach about chirality. So again, handedness, right? Again, I'm being critical and derisive of what I'd call ordinary curriculum. And I compete with it. I'm like, hey, Catholic school down the street, look what we're doing. Quakers up the street. You know, we already have a half coupler here. Had it for years because we recognize American transcendentalism is all part of the, you know, anti-slavery, equality, all this good stuff that has religious connotations. Uh, you know, we've, we've incorporated that. How about you guys? And then, you know, so-called public schools, be great if you understood your American heritage, because this was your greatest futurist for a while, until you decided to make, you made some other choices. Your so-called best and brightest decided they, they were going to drive instead, and now, now where, are we, where are we? So, speaking of which, I have been watching the impeachment hearings, pretty in detail, like hours a day. You can say I was there. I mean, I, I, paid, I paid attention. So here we go. We have a right, a um, four-walled tetrahedral space filler. And this is column three in the Goldberg uh, channel. And then we have a quarter right and a half right. So there's a way of taking this, this right and splitting it up in ways that the mites, the mites will put it together, but we can take it apart in different ways. And you can see the half right was a recent realization for David Kosky and I in terms of how it maps to Fuller's nomenclature. And my point along, you know, we're just discovering that recently. And he's gone, I'm lucky because he's showing me some videos I know that no one else has seen yet. New dissections based on um, what the half right can do, right? Once you've got the half right in your toolbox, what can you do, right? And so David is a master of VZOM and he's doing some interesting analysis here. And I'm one of the first people in the world who gets to see that. And so I feel priv privileged. So you get some good front uh, or edge, what do you call it? We're at the frontier in some ways. We're at the bleeding edge. I mean, the whole premise of this was undergraduates at MIT were studying this. That was the column or the article that got David thinking about this whole thing again, which got me to pull up the chart again, which got us to talk again about space filling tetrahedra and how Fuller has a whole vocabulary. When you take two mites together and snap them together, he calls that a site. And then when you take two sites together, uh, snap two sites together, you get what he calls, I think, a kite. And there's the, the kit and the cat and whatever. I mean, it's all very cute. And you can decide, no, I'm not going to use any of that. That's that nasty Bucky man. I don't want to use his way of talking. But I don't know why everyone had to decide that. I mean, I think there were enough of us who were interested in his industry, industry mist, aerospace supply test shelter. You know, what he did is he gave context to things. Now, I'm going to use that instead of popularize. People are always saying, oh, what Bucky did is he popularized the geodesic dome, and then he popularized the jitterbug, if you know what that is. He popularized some ideas about three-wheeled cars that other people were working on. So if I can find anyone else who ever was working on that, Octet Trust, then I can say, well, Fuller also, because he's not the only one, and therefore popularized, because taking from others, popularized meaning to steal. And this has been the complaint about Bucky. He had so many great ideas, but obviously he stole them all. And so I want to say contextualize instead of popularize, because thinking of domes is one thing, Maybe they're just going to be planetariums, right? You got the idea for geodesic dome, you patent it, and you only sell it as a planetarian item. But the idea that this could be the key to housing for massive numbers of people somehow, that the dome could be an answer. And again, Fuller's dome maybe had a freestanding structure inside. 
maybe more like a Japanese house inside with kind of a nice den garden as part of the surroundings with the dome big enough to take them both in and do the uh, shelter environment control part, right? So that's more Fuller's vision. So that's contextualizing the dome. And if he did only popularize the jitterbug, got it from somewhere else, at least he contextualized it by fitting it into his concentric hierarchy of polyhedra, volume four, and so forth. And here with the might of volume eighth, we're able to look at the space-filling tetrahedron and assign them all volumes because of how they fit into what we call the concentric hierarchy. So we are contextualizing, not popularizing so much. We're providing a context for, and it's pretty original. So that's how we rehabilitate Bucky, because if you go out there, you'll see, you'll see that we've had like 40 years since the 70s of none of this being of interest officially, right? You go to look at the old textbooks between 1980 and now, 2020, it's 2021 actually, uh, you're going to see a huge hole, and I'm going to say that was somewhat, uh, it wasn't a naturally occurring hole. It was an artificial hole, and a certain amount of work had to be done to make sure it was a hole, that we would not teach this material. That you still, sitting here in 2021 when I make this, have never heard of this space-filling tetrahedron issue, because Aristotle said hey, eh, tetrahedra fill space, but regular ones don't, of course. And so, yeah, that whole thing is bleeped over in your schooling, and why would you ever think of it after that? Like, there's no point. Like once you're through school and you're exposed to a series of like abstract concepts, then you're out in the real world, quote, quote, uh, you never hear about this stuff after that. So you're gone. And I'm saying, you know, that was a disservice to you. If you were born within the last 40 years, say, and you went to school and didn't get any of this, that was deliberate and it was a disservice to you. And now they say you're in debt on top of that. Right, because that's how they know how to deal with you. Make sure you're in debt, even though you got ripped off. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> anyway, enjoy the rest of your day. It's a snow day here. I wanted to show you that in my backyard today, because all this now, by the way, once you've got your concentric hierarchy and you've got your volumes and your space fillers and you got that uh, mnemonics, you got that those memes, you got that intellectual history. Then you can go on to talk about lattices, a la Sam Lanahan's actual structure here, not just abstract metaphysical, right? This is the real deal. This is like it really exists in my backyard. That's an N frequency, um, what do you call it? I'm trying to make it bigger, but I'm not succeeding. That's what I should have done. That's an N frequency, one, two, three cuboctahedron. So that layer, 10 to the F second power, 10 times uh, frequency to the second power plus two. Um, since it's a three frequency, one, two, three, uh, this would have nine times 10, 92 balls here in this layer, that kind of stuff. So we've got that whole uh, thing to go on to as a next topic. Like I'm saying, there's topic after topic that we can follow in kind of like a hypertune way, right? Hypertune is another discussion. Check my channel and enjoy the rest of your day. Talk to you soon.